Journeys in 2 Kings. This is the seventh and final video in our series from Abraham to exile. We've already seen Abram entering the land, his family leaving for Egypt, growing, returning, and ruling the land with judges before King David reigns from Jerusalem and passes the crown onto his son. So far, the story has been one of increasing political power. But then in 1 Kings, we saw the kingdom divide. Now here in 2 Kings, we will see it carried off into exile. We turn now from the Bible to a book of world history. The book we choose starts with Sumer and Egypt. The city of Ur was already thousands of years old when Abram left it. The historians also talk about the Indus Valley Civilization and other groups like the Hittites. Hey, remember Uriah the Hittite? We keep a narrow focus. Israel appears on the map. Assyria forms upstream on the Tigris and Euphrates. Israel expands first. And then Assyria. It conquers the ten northern tribes. And we will get to that in 2 Kings. Jerusalem remains standing as Assyria marches on to Egypt. And then another empire rises to sack Nineveh and Jerusalem. That is the historical outline. Israel up north will be carried off by Assyria, and then Judah in the south will be carried off to Babylon. That's at the end of 2 Kings, and we start from the beginning, with Jehoshaphat ruling in the south. Ahaziah, a son of Ahab and Jezebel, is in the north. But these kings are not the whole story or even the best part of it. Prophets like Elijah and Elisha are featured in the text. Amos, Jonah, and Hosea also speak to the north. Nahum prophesies judgment on Assyria. Obadiah pronounces judgment on Edom. In the south, Joel foretells disaster with Micah and Zephaniah. Isaiah gets a front row seat as Assyria conquers the north but fails to take Jerusalem, which is something Habakkuk sees in a vision and something Jeremiah will weep over. Ezekiel and Daniel are there to prophesy to the exiles, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi to those who return. But we are getting ahead of ourselves. Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, is in Jerusalem. But as chapter 1 opens, bad king Ahaziah consults with Beelzebub, fire consumes his soldiers, and Jehoram succeeds his brother. As Elisha watches Elijah be carried away in a chariot of fire. An alliance now with Edom against Moab. Elisha returns a boy to life, cooks soup, multiplies loaves, cures a general of a foreign nation, temporarily blinds soldiers, then gives them a snack. And that's not even everything he did. Aram lays siege to Samaria, but is scared away. Elisha pronounces Haziel the new king of Aram. Judah gets a new king too. God is angry though because Jehoram married Ahab's daughter. First, Jehoshaphat joined with Ahab to fight Aram. We remember that. Next, Jehoshaphat joined Jehoram to fight Moab. Now, Jehoshaphat has named his son after Jehoram of Israel and arranged a marriage to that king's sister. Cooperation can be a good thing, but it depends who you're cooperating with. The Edomites and Philistines revolt. Jehoram of Judah dies a painful death. Ahaziah joins his uncle to battle Aram, but Jehoram is wounded and the kings retreat. Then Elisha anoints Jehu to kill Joram and Ahaziah and Jezebel. That's the mother of one, maternal grandmother of the other. The land is finally free from that Sidonian witch and princess. But the bloodshed continues. Aram takes advantage of the chaos by taking the Transjordan, the end of Jehu. And we turn our attention to the south, to Queen Athaliah, mother of the murdered Ahaziah. And that means, if you're still with me, that would make her the wife of Jehoram of Judah and the daughter of Ahab. Seems like Jezebel's influence is not quite over. It lives on in this bad queen who murders the royal family. But young Joash is rescued and then made king by the priests. Joash's reign begins well, but ends poorly. He buys off the Arameans with gold from the temple. Second Chronicles shows him murdering the high priest before he himself is killed, and we turn back north. 
Jehoahaz battles back and forth with Aram. His son talks with Elisha, then battles Aram and Judah. In the south, Amaziah has success against Edom and failure against Joash. Jerusalem is sacked, the king assassinated. In the north, the kingdom grows. The southern kingdom expands as well, but this success does not last. Northern kings come and go. This one buys off Assyria as the kingdom shrinks. Another short reign, more territory lost. In the south, a new king fights Ammon, strengthens the temple, and humors Isaiah. Then Ahaz allies Judah with Assyria, which is very expensive, against Israel and against Aram, the last king of Israel. The people are deported. A new population is brought into the land and the end of the northern kingdom. We turn back to the south. At last, a good king, Hezekiah, strengthens the kingdom culturally and militarily through engineering and through spiritual renewal. Assyria is still thirsty. Should we rely on Egypt to save us? No, says Isaiah. The Lord is our salvation. And the angel of the Lord sends Sennacherib packing. Hezekiah is sick but recovers. His son, Judah's worst king. He immolated his own son by fire and filled Jerusalem with innocent blood. He repents while in exile, but the damage is done. His son, at least the one who escaped being sacrificed as an infant, is killed as an adult. And the last good king, a boy, repairs the temple, finds a book of the law, ends human sacrifice in the valley of Hinnom, that's Gehenna, removes, finally removes the golden calf in Bethel, one of those two idols that Jeroboam had set up when the kingdom first divided. They have watched over silently, and in a very real way they have caused the descent and the destruction of the people of God. Even Jehu, who was so zealous to wipe out the lineage of the Zidonians and the priests of Baal, even Jehu did not remove these idols. The sins of the foreigner are easier to see than the sins of our own ancestors. Bethel, Abram built an altar there in Genesis chapter 12, Jacob in chapter 28, Bethel, the house of God. Back to politics. Assyria is weakening, Egypt marches north, Josiah goes to meet them and dies on the plains of Megiddo, Armageddon. Egypt, for a short time, is the dominant power. Josiah's son is taken prisoner, dies there, and is succeeded by his brother. Placed on the throne by Egypt, he rules as a tyrant, killing the prophets. A new empire, Babylon, rises. They convince Jehoiakim to switch allegiances and take a few noble prisoners, including the prophet Daniel, as a down payment, the first Babylonian deportation. Three years pass, Jehoiakim and his son rebel. Nebuchadnezzar personally oversees the siege of Jerusalem. Thousands of craftsmen are taken, and so is the priest Ezekiel, the second Babylonian deportation. Nebuchadnezzar has taken the king to Babylon, so he puts his uncle on the throne. This will be the third son of Josiah to sit there. But when Zedekiah rebels, looking to Egypt instead of looking to the Lord for help, the game is over. The city is leveled, the temple is destroyed, the people are deported from Ramah, near to where Rachel was buried in Genesis 35. And we read in Jeremiah 31, a voice heard in Ramah, lamentations and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children because they were not. But this is not the end for King Jehoiachin, that's the second to last king. He is well treated in Babylon. It is not the end for Jeremiah, who is kidnapped, taken to Egypt, but is still a prophet. It is not the end for the children of Jacob, a faithful remnant will return from exile. It is not the end for Jerusalem, which will be rebuilt and redestroyed. Exile is not the end of the story, a story where God allows sin and suffering to afflict even his own chosen people. God allows it, and through it and out of it brings salvation. The Bible story. But we close the Bible now and turn back to the history book, Starting at the time when Israel's power is at its apex, Assyria rises and conquers the northern kingdom. Babylon rises, conquers Assyria, 
and sacks Jerusalem? Meanwhile, another empire grows. King Cyrus of Persia conquers Babylon, allows Jerusalem to be rebuilt, and his empire meets Greece. That's when westward expansion stops. Alexander charges east. Jerusalem is under a new empire, the Maccabees Revolt. The next world empire, Rome, makes Pontius Pilate governor of Judea. Jerusalem is leveled again. Emperor Constantine is baptized. And the story continues.